Ladies and gentlemen, the play is the thing. With your host, Judy Sleed. Special guest, Talia Connor, author of Jerusalem Maiden. Now here's Judy, Judy, Judy. Thank you, Lee. That was lovely. I have a wonderful guest, uh, a lady who is an author, Talia. So nice of you to come and visit us. Thank you, Judy, for having me here. And I read your book, and I've been telling everybody about it. It is a fascinating, wonderful book, and I hope you're going to tell us all about it. Thank you. And uh, I detect a slight accent. Where are you from? I was born in Israel. I'm an American novelist with an Israeli accent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if you could detect my accent because I'm a Hungarian <laughs> with an American. I'm an American with a Hungarian accent, yes. So uh, you were born in Tel Aviv, that's what you said. And uh, you've been but you are Americanized. <laughs> and you look so beautiful, you put Thank together, you. you could be a fashion designer. Maybe you are. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, you're not. I'm a full-time novelist. Full-time, but I that's I work rare. very hard on my craft. Yes, well, this book is all about women or Jewish people living in the 19th century. Well, come on, let's help me out a little bit. <laughs> okay, uh, Jerusalem Maiden is set in Jerusalem 100 years ago, the end of the Ottoman Empire, rule of the Holy Land. The Ottoman Empire ruled the entire region. Actually, it spread over four continents for 400 years. So when the novel starts in 1911, it's the last six years of those, this 400-year stretch because the Ottoman Empire ruled from 1517 to 1917. At any rate, uh, the protagonist, Esther Kaminsky, is 12 years old when we first meet her. She is supposed to get married shortly in, and produce many sons in order to hasten the Messiah's arrival. But she discovers her extraordinary talent for art, which is against the Second Commandment. Thou shall not make any graven image. And in Judaism, unlike Christianity, that is why art was never developed. The Western art as we know it today was developed under the auspices of the church. The church sponsored and patronized artists, needless to say, all men. But in this particular case, we have a young woman who knows that a visual expression is against God's Commandment. Now you're talking about as a woman, but she's only 12 years old and already she's supposed to get married at 12? That's what at that time in that society, they married the girls off very young because the entire community had a sense of mission of saving the word Jewry. Just living in Jerusalem was spiritual, a spiritual experience, so to supposedly, but... Um, the girls, the young women, married, hopefully, Talmudic scholars and supported them through a lifelong studies of the Torah. And their studies were supposed to help hasten the Messiah's arrival and bring salvation to all Jews. So the entire responsibility of saving the word Jewry was on the shoulders of 12-year-old girls. And that Which is where... Was extraordinary. I mean, it's extraordinary this... for us today. It's not totally unusual for any fundamentalist society, religious society, to put tremendous amount of burden on women in general. Because even today, when we look at societies, I mean, we, today we can look most, mostly at Muslim societies, where um, purity begins and ends with, with a woman's body. The religion is, is hinges on the separation of men and, and, and women, and women's obedience and child brides are uh, the, the common, uh, pra common practice because that's how you can continue to subjugate women. So it was not unusual in that 
situation in Jerusalem of 100 years ago. And interestingly, you mentioned you came from Hungary. Um, many people who came to Jerusalem at the time, and I'm talking late 1800s, early 1900s, mm -hmm. they came from societies where women got married younger than they do today, but not as children. And immediately, they, there was a change that was unusual, and sociologists never were able to fully explain why in Jerusalem of the time they married off girls as younger, as young as they did, but that's what they did as soon as girls reached maturity or puberty. And um, so my protagonist, Esther, discovers this extraordinary talent for art. She goes to school, which was also unusual because keeping uh, women whom you, you, society wants to marry them off young, it's very important to keep them not only uh, obedient and acquiescent, but also illiterate, which was the common, also common situation for that community. But there was a school, Evelina de Rothschild, which was developed at that time, had only 300 st girl students, but uh, my protagonist is one of the lucky ones, and she, her father does believe in educating her, his daughter. She finds out later that he does that because he wants her to be a better mother to boys. That was his entire reasoning mm -hmm. yeah. for sending her to school. But nevertheless, her French teacher discovers mm -hmm. her art. The French teacher herself is an amateur artist, and we meet mm -hmm. her over many years later uh, mm -hmm. in relations to that. And I, all I'm telling you now is only is, is not just chapter one, but the first two pages of yeah, the book. I know. When and I was from reading that point it, on, the when story I was reading on. it, it was very difficult for me to remember that she's only 12 years old because what she does, it's like a grown-up woman. At the same time, some of her, the ways that she visual, uh, envisions God and her importance in God's eyes, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was very interesting for my research to crawl into the skin of a young woman who has been indoctrinated to that aspect. And also very interesting, in Jerusalem of the time, we are talking about old Jerusalem, under the Ottoman Empire, they had not brought, they had not brought any development that we already saw in the rest of the world. So there were no, no running water, no sanitation, no electricity. And it's hard for us today to fathom what does it mean to live with no electricity because it also meant no news. It meant no information, no music. She never heard music in her life mm -hmm. until later on when her, she meets yeah. her cousin who plays music. And um, so here you have a very insular society, the ultra, ultra orthodox, that further isolates the girls, and it's easy because you don't have news, you don't have information. Her father reads the newspaper, so she sometimes sneaks a look yes. at that. And I like the part that when you're written uh, about her and her girlfriend, like the two young girls are conversing, there you could see that they are only 12 years old. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Yeah. So the research was very interesting because these um, J Jewish women in Jerusalem of the time, and most were very, very religious. Even the, the ones who were supposedly secular were pretty much entrenched in tradition. And I'm mm. not talking that was very different from the Zionist movement that had begun and had already was coming to the Holy Land with women who were coming from Europe, they were students already, they were mature, more mature, mm. and they were seeking um, equality with men and sometimes political voice. Guess what? Golda Meir was one, an example of the Zionist women, the same age as my protagonist. So now you can imagine the difference of the kind of women. We did not know, once there is a lot of information about the Zionist women because they wrote. They wrote letters back home, they kept journals, they wrote short stories, poetry, and so on. 
Not so the Orthodox women who thought that suffering in Jerusalem was going to bring the Messiah. It was good to suffer, but yeah. suffering meant water that was filled with a maggot, shortages, pestilence, plagues. Half their children died before the age of five. Infant mortality, 50%. 50% maternal, uh, maternal death because these young women started giving birth very early. And by the time they had a third and fourth and fifth child, there were still teenagers that would die. Mm -hmm. So that was all of this suffering was supposed to bring the Messiah. So and they didn't keep information or either they were illiterate or there was no information. So I had to do a lot of oral interviews, oral histories of old women about their mother's lives to get mm -hmm. those nuances. And well, you brought out the suffering very real. I mean, I felt it as I was reading it, especially with the cold. I never realized Jerusalem had snow. I mean, you would think uh, the whole country is always, because I have friends uh, and uh, in Israel, and it's, they always say it's how hot it is. You know, it, it, people don't realize how cold Jerusalem gets in winter. It is uh, freezing. Yeah. And especially, not only there's snow almost every year, it's, it's smittering. It's, it's little, maybe a couple of inches most, most of years, and it melts within a couple of days. But even my editor at the beginning was surprised. I sent her a link to... Uh, yeah. A website to see what's the weather in Jerusalem. <laughs> I looked it up on the internet <laughs> because I never thought Jerusalem. And you have many people are surprised <laughs> at that. What is important about it is how cold it got or it gets. And when you're not fully equipped, I mean, if you don't have, you cannot heat up the homes. You didn't have trees to create coals or fire, open fire. The, the heating of houses was very difficult, was a, a big problem. And at that time, the Ottoman Empire also was fighting battles all over the world in all mm -hmm. of its borders. So they were cutting down the woods in order to feed their trains and their war machines. And they were stealing, they were stealing everything they could from, from the countries they controlled. So yes, it was very cold in <laughs> Jerusalem. And what do you do when it's so cold? People just, if possible, they didn't leave the house. But mm -hmm. that is also when, the infant mortality reached new heights. It's in those cold weather. So it is, I, I visited Israel just once and it, it's beautiful. And uh, like you said, it's so much different than what it was 100 years ago. They did a tremendous job in Israel in just 100 years. What year were you there? Oh, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, uh, I was supposed to emigrate to Israel, but en route I changed <laughs> then I came here. So a lot of my friends are still there, so I went to visit them. So I really would like to see uh, a few pictures as we talk about how it was then and, and today, because now they have all these modern buildings and paved roads and highways. <laughs> Yeah. But it wasn't like that yes. 100 years it's ago. A, it, Israel is a very, very modern country. Yes. Very progressive, very advanced. Uh, the uh, gross national product is huge, great growth. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, Israel did not go through the uh, financial crisis, economic crisis that's been going on here for three years because it continues to grow all the time in spite of all its problems. But that is a totally different subject. We need to yeah. stay within a hundred years ago. Yes, a hundred so, years yes. ago. Um, what I also found very interesting was the different the neighborhoods in Jerusalem, the Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, once the the old city was extremely crowded, and they started moving out, creating new neighborhoods. But they were afraid of the the Turks would come in and steal children for lifelong service yes. in the army for 25 years. A child of nine would be kidnapped off the street, never to be returned to his family. So the way they built the neighborhoods, they would be um, made out of one to two 
uh, room houses that are all attached with the backs to the thoroughfares and in the center is where the community life took place. That's where the yeshiva would be, the water hall, the, water sh the uh, laundry shed, the outhouses, the, the oven, the bakery would be there because they couldn't create bake in their own homes and so on. So everything was in the center and the neighborhoods would have actually gates that would close for the night. That original structure is still there in all of these by, but one neighborhood that was taken down, replaced, but all of those buildings are still there. I walked with a 1912 map of Jerusalem with each building I could find, I could locate the same thing. What happened as there was more crowding, they filled the center open public space with alleys and more houses and rows of houses. They built second floors on some houses, which was not easy because the original structure had domes because they only knew how to build with this big stone the way the Arabs did. So the room, the one room house would have a big round dome. So you couldn't build the second floor very easily. So you mm -hmm. had to build it in between two domes, between two houses, you would build another room that would serve for another family. So that was kind of tricky, but in that neighborhood, this is where those women were gathering. They rarely left. They'd, they had been indoctrinated for fear of others. Others would be anybody that was not their own community, even other Jews, mm -hmm. let alone Arabs and Christian missionaries, which they were very active in that time. Mm -hmm. And beside the fear of others, they were also covered with in heavy clothing and by ignorance and by suffering and by not keeping any information and giving out any information. So I discovered this to be a very well-kept secret and I needed to find out how a young woman in that society who is seeking freedom could find it without losing her faith. It's very easy to say, okay, give up on God and go off. No, no. you can't do that when God no. is crouching in one's head and is there reading her thoughts, seeing every vision that she sees, remembering her dreams after she wakes up and holding them against her. Yes. So how can this young woman find freedom? And that is the question that also comes up Today, when we look at religious societies, fundamentalist societies, where women don't have choices because they're indoctrinated, but also women who are not in religious societies, do we all get as much freedom as we could claim, or do we have psychological inhibitions that prohibit us from following our dreams or our talents or, or living our own lives to their fullest? Well, that all depends where you come from and what beliefs you have and then where you go, your, your environment. If you come in contact with other people who have more freedom, then you have a choice. But you said it's, it all depends what is inside you, how you feel about it. So there is a conflict, and in your book, certainly there is a tremendous amount of conflict, how this uh, young woman deals with her emotions and feelings and what is right and what is wrong and how she sees the world. I mean, you do a beautiful job explaining that. Yeah, and I want to say something. This book was inspired <laughs> by my own grandmother's untapped artistic genius. Oh. I always thought, when I was 16 actually, I walked, I was, was in Paris for the first time. I was going to <laughs> talk and, about that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I went to a French high school in Tel Aviv and I was sent by my school for a month to France and I was walking in Montmartre, which is, everybody knows, where Sacre-Cœur is and, and all mm -hmm. the artists, the street artists. And I suddenly understood with this unshaken knowledge that my grandmother should never have been my grandmother. She should never have gotten married. She should never have had children. Oh. 
Oh, Instead, huh. she should have been an artist during the avant-garde era mm -hmm. and have achieved international claim as an artist. So Jerusalem Maiden, which we see the picture of the cover here. Yes. And you have a book here, I see. Um, it's a what if story of what, what if, if my grandmother had bolted and tried to fly instead of having her wings clipped. And I had the book, my, my mother read and her two sisters, or three still alive. She has one more sister, but she didn't read the book. But three sisters read the book and they all said that I nailed the character of their mother perfectly without any single event being in her life. It's all fictionalized. It's not her life. It's not that the home is not the home she grew up in because my family was very well established in Jerusalem and did not live in a kind of squalor, which was the most common situation. They came, they were pretty well to do. But even my mother said to me, how did you know that my grandfather had a roll top desk for his <laughs> financial business? You know, yeah. it's, I had so many details that I got out of that, and uh, especially the character of a woman who is unhappy because she, she eventually, when we see her later, when she gets married, she, she a lot of women would have been very content with her oh, life. Oh, yes. But the struggle is internal. Uh -huh. The struggle for fulfillment is totally internal. Another thing I stood out when you talked about Paris, that the sun was out till 10 p.m. Oh yeah, in the summer in Europe, <laughs> you know how it is in Europe in the summer. Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> um, depends on the time zone, but yeah. it's uh, yeah. You it describe is, uh, Paris maybe beautifully or something in summer. It's uh, you and know, I like the way you describe that uh, French lady who is teaching art. That's also very delightful, the way yeah. you deal with She's it. She's an early feminist. Yes. She's an early feminist. Yeah. And it is, we get some little things from her, Mademoiselle Thibault. Mm -hmm. 